All right, so today's workshop is a result of a very congenial relationship that we've built up over several years and is one aspect of the continuing stewardship of the Headwaters Sanctuary, even though today we're not actually going to be entering into the Headwaters to do our training. So we do have an aspiration that out of this training will come an interest in people doing more measuring. I don't have a list of trees already made up, so please speak up about places you love and trees you love that are in those places. And we can start from the places that really motivate us. And then when we get a, a good at it, or at least a little experience, we can announce this. And let me tell you, once you do that, you are flooded with people who have the biggest tree you've ever seen in the world. <laughs> so we may have to set up some kind of criteria. Uh, but I'm going to hand this over to these folks right now, but I do want to put a brag announcement. Can you just talk a yeah, four that's, seconds I'll about hang it over to Roberts Roberts is. So the secret identity for the three of us up here is this book, which is The Famous Trees of Texas, which is a product, for, uh, a re revision, a new edition, for the centennial of the Texas Forest Service a couple of years ago. And Gretchen had the main workload of doing the updates and the edits and everything else. <laughs> And then she called Mark one day and said that they needed some pictures of one tree in San Antonio and frankly, could they find somebody to take the pictures? So the, the bookmark here is a picture that I had the pleasure of taking <laughs> of Mark and, and uh, the, burnt, the burnt oak, which is at a, an old um, golf course, uh, Pecan Valley on the south side of town. It is a beautiful, if I recall correctly, 22 feet in circumference. Mm, wow. So since then, I've had the pleasure of doing several other trees, some of which are on private land, and you'll never know where they are, because even though they go and measure them, they're not going to tell you where they are. Um, others of which have been on public land. So I find tree measuring a whole lot of fun, especially in great company. So I hope you find this kind of activity just as satisfying as I have. And it's the kind of thing that you can walk away from and then come back a few years later and learn again and see which new tools have been invented to help make it even simpler. So I'm going to hand it over to Pam, our host. Um, a couple of you already know about the headwaters, so bear with me. One of whom is in the back, our new member of our board, Michael Goldstein. But first of all, I'd like to welcome you to Headwaters and Incarnate Word. You were actually not in Headwaters, as Lisa mentioned. Uh, you are in the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word property. Um, in brief, in 1897, they bought over 300 acres from Colonel Brackenridge. And that ended up delivering to us the University of Incarnate Word, the Incarnate Word High School, the village of Incarnate Word, the property you see, the smaller property you see here, and then 12 years ago, 53 acres of undeveloped land, the last undeveloped land of those, that original parcel, were set aside as a nature sanctuary, now called Headwaters Incarnate Word. And our mission is uh, ecological restoration of that property, education, and that's why you're here, and a public service, providing that open space in the heart of San Antonio for folks to have access to nature, nature that is not a park. As you know, that there's a distinction between a park and a nature sanctuary. So we welcome you here today. All of our events are, uh, for the most part, are free and are funded by donations. So here's my pitch. Um, we appreciate your donations in person or online or participation in fundraising events of any kind because that's what helps us plan going forward. And we're very excited to have this team here. We hope we will able be able to do future workshops of this nature with this team. And I'm going to turn it over to them for their own introductions and welcome you all to Headwaters. Thank you for being here. All right. Well, welcome everybody. You found us in this cold, yes. unforecasted rainy day. I think you all probably did the same thing I did, but it looked to be drier. Um, so the beauty of today and the magic is getting to measure and learning how to syst um, systematically measure these big trees. So San Antonio turned 300 years old this year, tricentennial, and probably there are some trees within a couple hundred yards that were probably alive when that happened. So 
very, very old trees, very beautiful trees, magnificent. Um, so we're, we've got a fun day for you to learn those skills, how to measure, but uh, talking to Lisa, um, what we'd like to do eventually is to, during this tricentennial, tricentennial year, to get a document of these big, large trees um, of the, the species that we recommend or native to San Antonio. So around 30 trees, um, find the biggest ones, have us go out there, measure it, create the document um, for posterity's sake. So um, to help us with that, uh, somebody I have a tremendous amount of respect for, um, Gretchen Riley. Um, she's going to help us and guide us and give us the skills because she's been doing this. She's been the, the custodian of that big tree uh, registry for a long time. Um, and she um, is trained at the national level and she's here. And I'm, I'm going to assist her as she needs it, but she's going to be the, the star of the day. So thank you, Gretchen. Star. Well, <laughs> I do want to. I'm going to take this now and okay. report it to the And I might so I change the lighting the bar a little bit. My name was John the Ross. Okay. I do want to tell you guys that uh, you are getting your, your instruction today from somebody who's on the national cadre for the American Forest Big Tree Program. So really, this, is, um, this doesn't happen across the country very often, and you guys are really one of the smaller groups that we're, we're able to do this with. So I think it's great. There have been some changes in the program over the years, and most recently in the last couple of years, you're going to get what those are. If you have been involved in measuring big trees for a while, you'll think, uh-oh, something's different. If you haven't been involved in measuring big trees, then hopefully you'll, you'll leave being able to at least wow your friends and family because you can estimate height now very easily, or actually you will be when you're done here. So we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, a couple things that I think it's important to know to, to understand, especially if you're thinking about doing a local registry of some kind or another is how they all play together. So the Texas Big Tree Registry, which at some point in time I'll have the, the web URL, I, it's changed a little bit and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it'll be up here. The Texas Big Tree Registry is the statewide champion tree program. Every state in the country has one. It is a list of the largest individual specimens for each species in Texas. And I am going to have to break down and do the glasses business. I can't see without them, and I can't see with them. So it's really a challenge for me. So this is the state version of the national program. American Forests has been doing a national registry for decades. And we have been participating in it since the 60s. Some early champions of champion trees were um, Joseph Stearns. So he wrote an article in, in uh, 1940 for American Forests. He's really one of the big champions and got the program going. Also, Maryland State Forester really helped get this national program going. And it really is one of those, those national programs that help bring attention to these really great fabulous trees across the country. So as I mentioned, it was established in 1940, the national program, and it started with just 100 trees. The people in 1940, in the, in the uh, decades following that, they were looking at the, what they thought were just the largest of the large trees. Now we look for the largest specimen of all tree species, all native and naturalized tree species. <clears throat> see what we get here. In Texas we've got 320 of those. So sometimes w the largest specimen of a very small tree, like a hawthorn, parsley hawthorn, might not be a very big tree and you could walk by it in the woods and not be impressed. So there have been some, some local champions of trees as well, or state champions of trees, that have gone out and combed the woods and found those big trees that you and I might just walk right by because we didn't recognize them as being the largest of that particular species. There are 83 trees in the state that are national champions. So we've got 83 national champions. We've got 320 species in Texas, 
and 83 of those species are national champions. They're the largest across the country. Yeah, so this is our new URL. We just put this online about six months ago, five or six months ago, and it allows real-time data. So as soon as I get a new champion, enter that into the database, it's showing right here. So we really keep it up to date. It has maps for all publicly accessible trees. So you can go find them. It's got photos of all trees. We've got photos for. There are some that were discovered decades ago that um, we had, there was a couple of, of really great naturalists that wandered the states in search of big trees and they found them, but they didn't always take snap photos. And uh, we, we believe them because after all, they, you, you've heard of them. Um, some of them, Benny Simpson, if you guys are familiar with, he, he had nominated probably for a long time, he had the most champions nominated over any other people, persons in Texas. Jim, James Lyles, who was the um, superintendent at Big Bend, he has, now I think he has the, the longest running list of current national champions. He no longer lives here in Texas, but... Anyway, what's the purpose of the Big Tree Registry? Why do we do it? It's cool to see really big trees, but there's other reasons that we do it. And, and one of the reasons the Texas Forest Service is engaged in this program is because we, uh, we want to bring recognition to the value that these trees provide to all Texans. To you, and if it's your own that stands in your yard, to your neighbors, to the community, to the state itself. And uh, we want to preserve them if at all possible. There is no special designation that comes with being a champion as far as um, from a legal standpoint. It's not going to save the tree if TxDOT needs to go through it, um, although it has, but not because it has that designation, but because people like you go out there and say, look, I think you can reroute this road, or I think you can build a subdivision around this tree because it's really important to us. And look, see, it's really important to lots of people. So we do like to see, anytime we hear about trees being saved because of uh, the, the value that they offer, I think that's a great story to tell. And um, a tree that is the largest known specimen of its species, that is something worthwhile, worthwhile keeping, something worth bragging about. So what trees are eligible for listing? And they must meet the definition of a tree. This is a woody plant. There's a number of different definitions for trees out there, but this is the one that's recognized by American forests. It's a woody plant having one erect perennial stem or trunk, and that's kind of important. We'll have to remember that as we talk about measuring rules that's at least three inches in diameter at breast height, okay, and it is more or less formed with a crown of foliage, meaning it's not a shrub, and it has to retain a height of at least 13 feet. So there are some things that cross, you know, they're right on the border of do we really think that's a tree or a shrub, and some people will argue one way or another, but what it really comes down to is is this a normal way of growth for it? And then we'll take it. Um, Albert Little made that definition, and Mark has this actual uh, 1979 checklist of trees that is the original list of species eligible to be called trees and recognized by American forests. 2009 botanists like to, to change names and and changed all sorts of things for us. And so in 2009, the, the species list was updated a little bit to uh, reflect what some people had changed. Now, these are native and naturalized trees only. And most of you, I'm sure, I know you are way ahead of the majority of our audience, and you know exactly what that means. But native, of course, is what was here before we were keeping track of what was around. And naturalizes, what I like to say is, is um, it's uh, behaving respectably and not out competing its neighbors. So it's kind of a, a nice way to say it. Oh, and I just gave you that. Okay. 
So we have recognized that, you know, sometimes it's fun to look at some other species as well. So we have what we call an ornamental list. And that includes some things like uh, fruit trees and, um, actually I don't want to, Vitex is actually on that. There's a number of different things that are on the ornamental list. We don't pursue that. We don't kick it up the food chain to the national list per se. But sometimes it's really fun to have, uh, you know, if you've ever seen an astronomical uh, peach tree that has a, you know, a circumference that's this big, that's pretty impressive. And so it's great to have it on the list. So how do trees make it on the list? Well, they've got to be nominated. There are forms that you guys will have more than you ever want today, but two sides to it. It's got to be filled out in entirety before we even consider looking at it. Once we get the form, then um, and accompanying photos, then we're going to compare it to a circumference threshold. So each species on the list has a circumference threshold. That keeps us from looking at all trees that people think are big. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at the post oak on um, College Station. I got post oaks, and I think I've got some really big post oaks, and they don't even come close to the champion post oaks. Live oaks are a great example. We have, it, everything has gone digital, but we happen, happen to maintain an archive of all hard copies for the Big Tree Registry because it's been around a lot longer than uh, digital files have been. And we have about four files this thick on live oaks because everybody thinks they've got the biggest live oak they've ever seen in their yard or down the road or something like that. And it's really very, very small compared to the champions. Very, very small compared to the one that's out over here in the courtyard that I got to see the, this, this morning that's beautiful, which wouldn't even compete for the champion. So there are, um, a, as I mentioned a little, a little bit earlier, there are a lot of regional, several regional lists out there. The most active ones are one in Dallas and one in, in Houston. And in both of those areas, it is regional. It's not city. So the, uh, the Dallas list is, um, they call it, uh, it's kind of Texas Tree Trails, but that's really confusing with another one of our programs. Yeah. But, but they maintain the entire metro area, and they'll go out even a little bit farther than that. We get a lot of our champions from their list. So their curator, when they've got champions, they'll be looking at the Texas Big Tree Registry, and when there's one that they have that happens to get up pretty darn close, to what the champion is, they'll submit it to me and say, hey, you know, I'd like to, to nominate this for the Texas Registry and uh, we keep, I'd like to keep five or ten of each species as possible on the list because you have a, a year like this last year or the last five years or maybe let's all go all the way back to 2011. Since then, we've lost many, many champions mm -hmm. and not just the number one but the number two and sometimes even the number three. So it really helps to have five, six, seven trees of each species on the list so that you can immediately crown a new champion. The, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth program, they keep quite a few. The Houston area, this is mostly Harris County Registry, they put out a publication every couple of years. That's the, the cover of it. It's really a really nice publication. It has photos of all of their champions and their measurements, and the uh, Houston Area Urban Forestry Council sponsors that, as well as Trees for Houston. Hmm. We get a lot of our champions from there as well, because there are a lot of people that are looking and measuring and finding. This is our website. As you can see, we've got 83 national champions and 273 state champions. Now. Who can remember how many species, native and naturalized species, we've got? 320. 320. What's the problem? Uh, yes. There's no entries? There's no entries. We have so many. Actually, there's more than just do the math. There's more than uh, um, 45 that are without 
uh, a tree at all on the list because we have co-champions, which I'll get to in a minute. So some species actually have two. They're counted in this number as two. So there's a probably out there 50 to 55 species that you could find the champion for and have your name listed as the nominator. Now, I do the same thing that the regional registries do. So every year, National Forest says to me, hey, it's getting time. I need your nominations. And I'll comb through and I'll see what I've got that might be competitive at the national level. I like to call them pretenders, pretenders for the crown. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the, one of the reasons, there's a couple ways to get kicked off the list on the national level. One is if there's a larger one found. Another way is if no one's looked at the champion and remeasured it in five years. So I'm looking not just at sizes, I'm looking at dates. So if something <coughs> hasn't been measured in a while, well, I'll hurry up and, and nominate one of ours. And then that's really a way we get a fair number of champions. But unfortunately, it's also the way we sometimes lose champions. Because some of our trees are really hard to get to. In fact, I have... Um, we just lost our state champion, Aspen, which will never compete for national. But, um, and it's a long, hard hike in um, Big Bend, in the Chisos. And the number two, which is, I've crowned it, but I'm going to have to go see it. It's in the Guadalupe's. And I just was talking with our forester out there, and he says, oh. And I tell him, I'm like, I'm all excited. He's like, oh. He goes, I haven't done that hike in years. And the last time I did it, it took me over 11 hours just to get there. And that was not even turned around. He said, but he did it from the back side, the New Mexico side. Yeah. So anyway, hard to get there every five years. When truth, the, the truth is, I, I'm, I'm talking all, like I do this all the time, and the big tree program is really only about 10% of my job. So really tough to get out there and do the fun hikes every five years, but I like to do it anyway. So, how is a champion determined? Now, I said it's got to be the largest, but how do we know it's the largest? And, and the way that the powers that be back in the 40s when they developed this program determined that this, they developed an index that could be compared across not just uh, trees, individual trees, but species, so that you're ending up with the same, uh, essentially the same, um, uh, criteria and the, val the value. So circumference in inches, we're looking at that. We talk all the time in forestry and in arboriculture about diameter at breast height, but in big trees, we're looking at circumference. Okay? We're looking at height in feet, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then we're looking at the average crown spread in feet. And I'll show you how that's done in, uh, in just a little while. So the index is, is by dropping the units. And then you take, so you take that circumference value, which let's say it's 100. And you add it to the height. Let's say it's 100. And then you add one quarter of the average crown spread. So let's say the average crown spread is 100. It was 100 this way and 100 that way. Nice, it's 100. Okay, and one quarter of that is 25. So you would then add that to the height and the circumference measurement and your index would be 225. The good thing is I've got a database that does the math for me and all we need to ever do is take the measurement. So trees within, I mentioned that it's something called co-champs. So trees within five-point index are considered co-champs. Now why do you think we might allow that to be the case? Does anybody have a good idea? Well, the formula is arbitrary. You know. Well, the formula isn't arbitrary, but there is something kind of arbitrary behind it. And the tree growth will vary from year to year. Tree growth varies from year to year. Yours, <laughs> yours exactly. If, if I'm doing it on um, uh, in, in spring versus fall, 
there might be a foot difference in height. You know, that, that could really, I mean, one point, you want to lose your champion status for one point. It might be that there, you take it on a really humid day. You know, the, the measurements taken when it's humid, everything's just a little bit more expanded than it is on a dry day. So our measurements are, even though we try to get them as accurate as we possibly can, they can vary a little bit. And so we don't want to have it be exactly within one point of determining the champion and kick, kick the king off the throne if indeed it's just a variance from year to year. All right, so if you're a tree owner or you're a nominator, what do you get? Wow. Well, <laughs> you get a certificate. That's one thing. You get a recognition ceremony if you want it. So a lot of times there are some um, public places that like that. Most homeowners don't. <laughs> Press release. A lot of times this, this happens actually quite frequently. Um, the champion Faxon Yucca is, is out front. One of the co-champion Faxon Yuccas, and yes, it's considered a tree, is um, out front of the Chewies in Van Horn. So if you ever take I-10 and you want to go and stop, and it's like they claim they claim the original Chewies, and um, there's facts on Yuck out front. That's one of the co-champions, and they wanted to have a press release. Well, great, great PR for uh, business, right? But then, really, what you get is this satisfaction of owning it. You get bragging rights. That's what we say. That's the main thing that both owners and nominators get. You want this chair? No. no. Okay. Floor is good. Okay. So our the site that I told you about, if you have a chance after we're done today, I encourage you to go and look at it because it's got a it's got some really nice little features on it. It's got a search function. It's got the maps I told you about. It's got photos. It's got the official list. Okay, so you can wonder if you want to know if the tree that's in your yard or in your neighbor's yard or down the, down the way, if that compares at all, you can just, actually it's, it's even mobile friendly, so you can just hop on and say, oh, well let me see. So, before we get into, oh, I don't have speakers, but you might actually appreciate the sound of that. Um, before we get into how to measure, I want to look at how big is big. So here are some champion. This is the former state champion, state co-champion bald cypress. Okay, that's big. Former state champion bald cypress. <laughs> this tree is also a famous tree. It's in our book here. It's a great tree. One of the things that is really unique about it is, you know, back here is the river. I think it's the Frio. Yeah. yeah. And so you'll if you know how bald cypress grow, you can take a look at that and you can recognize that there is a lot of fill at the base of that tree. Oh my god. So this is likely so yeah, if you took took the diameter of this tree, took the circumference at the four and a half foot level, that's likely to be many, many feet above what it would be if there wasn't all this fill. So this tree, really, if we were to really wanting to be, compare apples to apples, comparing this tree to other bald cypress that had their base exposed, this tree would undoubtedly outrank them all. Because as you know, a tree is wider at the, at the base and as it grows, it narrows, so higher up, until it starts branching, higher up is always going to be narrower. Cool tree. This is the state champion, bald cypress. Now, they grow them big out there because it's also on the, the Frio. Wow. You know what, you guys? This is out of focus, isn't it? Let me see. So Gretchen, 564 points. Ah, I can't. Yeah. So circumference is 300 and something. Big. 
<laughs> um, I, I, I don't remember the yeah. particulars on this exactly, but it would have to be, yes. Wow. So I know the 240 is the, the circumference threshold. That's really tough for Woo. my mouth to say. That's 20 feet. Yeah. So 20, 240 inches is also the threshold mm. for live oaks. Meaning, don't even bring me those that are just sort of big. Okay, state Whoa. champion bald cypress. It's, a, it's actually the same tree, but a, from a different angle. <coughs> this is the national champion Montezuma bald cypress down in um, Hidalgo County. Former national champion Texas live oak. This is also in our famous trees book. Some of these trees are big, partly because they've been around a long time. And because they've been around a long time, they witnessed some really interesting historical events. There is someone some of you guys might know. And Duff, here. It? It's another Mark. Yes. That's Mark Duff, who used to be out of our San Antonio. He's retired, yeah. This is a national champion Texas live oak now. Former state champion live oak. This is the Goose Island oak. This is, this is an old photo. So this is one of the, this is a 1960s photo taken back when we first were st sort of starting the program. And I put it in there. Here's the tree. To, um, it's not exactly today, but it, it, this was taken in 2013. State champion pecan. This is actually the national champion pecan. It was the national champion pecan for decades, decades since 1974, I think it was. And um, this is a part of the reason I got on the National Measuring Cadre was because they kicked it off the list. Because of something I'm going to talk to you about here in a little bit, is they, they claimed that it was two trees. Mm -hmm. oh. Well, um, sometimes I can buy that. But when I start looking at the, the place of forking, and actually, as you, if you look around the side of this tree, it's, uh, it's wide there, too. It's not just narrow. So it, um, anyway, we got it back on as the national champion, the common. This tree is the national champion, Texas persimmon. It has been, it is the longest running national champion. It's been a national champion since the late 60s. <laughs> Former national champion Rio Grande Cottonwood, this tree was lost in 2011 in the Rock House fire. It's still out there. There is, you have to look a little hard if you're coming going south on from Fort Davis, there is a charred fork several hundred yards out to pasture. But this uh, I was a loss to that community quite a bit. So, any questions before we get on how to measure? And you have plenty of time to ask them questions. So, the measuring rules. Circumference. I have one. Yes. Um, with the cypress tree and the knees being covered, yeah. or the root system being covered, um, is, that, is that dangerous for the tree to cover it like that? And would there'd be more pressure for them not to do that? Since so it has, it was not ever covered by man. Oh. So that was covered oh, over it. time oh, for just it. with flooding. Bringing. So not a problem, obviously. Yeah. Doing great. Yeah. Yeah, the text for seven, it has more than one. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like a great motor. So. We're going to talk to you about that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know. Lots of problems with that one. So, circumference. Very nice if you're measuring a telephone pole. It's really easy to do it. So, in general, you want to take the narrowest point between four and a half feet above the ground and the ground. So, the reason we take the narrowest is because this is the big tree program and the tendency to enlarge everything is very great. We want to round up. We round down. Always. We're looking for the smallest in 
that we can possibly do and still have it be the largest. So I know that sounds contradictory, but we're looking for the narrowest point because otherwise you would choose that burl that's sticking out yeah. and add a couple inches. Or you would say, by golly, we are doing it at four and a half feet. I don't care what's going on there, even if it's starting to fork there. So it is the narrowest point. But it's got to be below any fork. So if you have a fork that comes out at one uh, feet above the ground, a nice, let's call it a nice horizontal limb, no doubt in your mind, it's just a fork. You've got to measure below that, even if it's narrower um, above. So it's got to be below any forking. And you're going to record it in inches. You're going to round it down. You've got to make sure that you're looking at inches, that you're using a, um, a circumference tape, just a plain old tape. So we use this and just wrap it around, telephone pole, pull down the side a little bit, do it, take the end, read, the, read it. Doesn't matter here because you're just rounding it down, but sometimes some of these tapes have one side that's in tenths and another side that's in inches, and if you do tenths, it's not the same. So even if you round it down, you might end up being an inch higher than it would normally be if you're using the tenths. So don't use the tenths, use the inches. The other thing that people have, I can't tell you how many times we get problems, is somebody will use a diameter tape. They got, especially foresters, let me tell you, foresters are a big problem this way, because they all, like, you know, they gotta have it and make it make noise. All that stuff. So, so they'll wrap it around and they'll read it because the diameter tape you wrap around and they'll read it and they'll go great. It's 59. Well, that was that's diameter because oh. it's designed to give you a diameter reading, mm -hmm. even when though you wrap it all the way around the tape, the tree, because it's designed for one person, so they can just get up to it, wrap it around, get the reading, and go on. But it's in it's diameter. It converts it already for you. So it's taken the whole thing and multiplied it by, or um, divided it by 3.14, and it's given you the diameter on here. So that, one of you guys, one of you teams might end up with this. So be very, very careful about that. Now, another thing, a couple other things on, on uh, circumference is that you want to do, you want to make the measurement perpendicular to the stem of the tree. So not parallel to the ground, ideally in a telephone pole, it would be, all right? But trees don't grow like that most of the time. So if a tree is growing like this, you wanna make sure you're measuring the circumference of the stem itself and not any relationship to the ground, other than that four and a half thing going on. Now, what happens if, let me see what we're going to do here first. Oh, yeah, yeah. So say four and a half foot is the narrowest looking spot. You can see it's a really nicely tapered tree. But right at four and a half foot, there's this really big burl. So it's only right there, right at four and a half feet. You want to measure right above and right below, and then you take the smallest. You also want to record where you measured it. You want to do this for every um, measurement, even if it's at four and a half foot. There's a spot on the form where you circle that four and a half foot because you want to be able to duplicate this. So you want someone else to be able to follow in your footsteps and get the same measurement. So if you ended up measuring it at 18 inches above the ground, you mark that there. Let's see if I go there. Now, if the tree forks below four and a half feet, and sometimes if the fork's above four and a half feet, there are special rules that apply. And let me see if I get to them. Okay, before I get to them, I want to talk to you a little bit about slope. So a tree 
doesn't always grow in a nice flat pasture either. And so this four and a half foot rule, if you've got a slope on the ground, do you measure four and a half feet from the upside or four and a half feet from the low side? Average? Yes, average. So, so the answer was yes. You measure four and a half <laughs> feet above, you know, on the high side, and four and a half feet from the low side, and then you take the middle point, and you actually measure it right at the middle point. So four and a half feet up here, four and a half feet up here, there's a, let's say there's a foot between the two, then you would actually measure your circumference at that six inches. And that's your four and a half foot line. Now remember, you also need to find out and make sure that that's actually the narrowest spot. So you would measure it there and three or four times down the trunk just to ensure that you've actually picked the narrowest spot. But you wouldn't have to go any higher than that. All right, let's talk about those forking rules. The pith test. So pith, again, and I don't mean to insult anyone's intelligence here, but I find it's better if we just pretend we don't, we don't speak the same language. And uh, the pith is the, what I call the pencil lead. You know, if you think of a trunk as being a, like a pencil and there's lead in the middle of it, the, that's the pith. So the pith test is to be considered a single specimen, the pith intersection must be at or above ground. So let's look at this tree, which is, by the way, the former state champion uh, live oak, Virginiana. There's one nice little pith. That one, okay, that's, that intersection is above ground. That whole side, above ground above ground. Well, he's standing here, okay? The picture's kind of off a little bit. Is that above or below ground? It's below because we never do see where it is. It's somewhere down here below ground. So this is considered another specimen. Oh. This is actually two trees. And only this part gets counted. This is where you measure circumference. Actually, there's really some really kind of cool tools out there. One of them, this one, it's a reticle. Oops, and it's connected to things. And you can use this to measure from a distance without ever touching the tree. And we could go to four and a half feet above and measure the diameter, use this to measure the diameter and come up with a four and a half foot measurement for this particular tree, if we wanted to. So you just discount the other big chunk of tree? Yep, nothing gets counted. Not the height, not the crown, nothing. That's another tree altogether. Might as well be a pecan somewhere else. Yep. So, three different styles of trees. You've all seen them. We know the first one, pretty easy. Four and a half foot. This is diameter for us type. Nice, not quite a telephone pole, but that's uh, our classic kid drawing of a tree. And uh, nice and easy to measure. We know what to do with that one. This one, pit intersection is above ground. All right, definitely forking. We have to do below the fork, and we want to take the narrowest spot, so it's that. <coughs> Fairly straightforward. Once you start moving that tape down, you can figure that out pretty quickly. This one over here, fifth intersection is below ground. What are you going to do? <coughs> Measure the largest. Now, there are a few species that don't really grow like this. And um, then we can use what's called the combined area method. Now, actually, crepe myrtle doesn't get to fall in this category because crepe myrtle will actually grow like a regular tree. So we have um, 
we, we do crepe Merlot on a case by case basis because sometimes you'll have you know how they grow overnight it seems and they've had all those trunks and they'll might grow together well that doesn't get to have the same um, weight we'll, we'll call it as a single trunk specimen like a good nice notches might grow and, and be this big around really big but there are some species that ne will never grow like this unless forced by uh, you and I to, to, to do that and coppice type growth and in that case we can use what we call the combined area method and I don't think I have it I don't I do have a a spreadsheet for it I've got again a nice little calculator for me but that combined area method actually takes the area of each trunk you would measure each trunk at the four and a half foot level or the narrow spot below there and then plug it into this calculation along with a measurement at the root collar, basically right above the ground, and the smallest of those two would be recorded. So again, we're looking for the smallest, but there's a way to get these truly multi-trunk species and allow them to, to be compared across with each other. It doesn't, a tree that just grew that way, you know, uh, especially live oaks are a really great example, especially in around Austin area, those fusiformes, they start out like, you know, they're, they're two feet apart from each other, really growing in this nice little mott. But over 100 to 200 years, they're going to grow together and be, be uh, many trees. And in one, it looks like one specimen to us, well, to the average person, but all of us know when we look at them that indeed it is more than one trunk there. All right, so height. Height seems fairly straightforward. You basically have two planes. One's the ground, one's the top, the very top, the last live spot you could ever see up there. One leaf sticking up today gets to be the tallest spot. So we want to measure between those two planes, essentially taking a plumb bob and dropping it from this very top spot down to the very bottom. Okay, that's our desired measurement. We use a lot of different things to do it. Our forester's favorite tool is a clinometer. You guys will get to play with that. It's a little, if you haven't used one, it's actually a little hard to get used to. Um, but the, the basic idea is that you, you just pull the tape out 100 feet and then you can read right there. You can do it less than 100 feet. The easiest possible way to do it, and, and we'll give some demonstrations and show you how to do it, is to go to measure out from the base of the tree, 100 feet, and then you can use whatever you're reading in your clinometer will actually be, the you don't have to, to multiply it by 50% or whatever. What, what it might actually be. Now, the, the critical thing about um, height is that we don't always, the high point isn't always right over the base of the tree. So it's really important to know where, oh, yeah, where the actual top is. So a lot of times, you, yeah, if you get too close, you're thinking, but you're thinking this is it, but you're actually measuring right up here because it's measured using trigonometry. We take as long to do height as any other measurement, longer really. Uh, you'll walk 360 degrees around the tree from a, as far away from the tree as you can get to potentially identify where the top little leaf sticking up is because if this is nice, because this is a nice flat ground, but as we talked about, rarely is ground actually flat. And so if the top of the tree, let's see if I got something here. Yeah, where's the high point relative to the base? All right, what if it's over here? And it's supposed to be here, but you're actually measuring something that's kind of coming like this. You're going to end up with it's not a right triangle anymore. Your handy dandy little I'll do the trigonometry for you tools <coughs> don't work anymore because 
you're off. And it can actually make a pretty big difference. I bet I can't do this without wrecking everything. This is a, a, a um, this shows what the error can be. Uh, this is based upon your angle here. But um, it can be 16 feet in error just depending upon the angle that you're, you're using your, uh, your measuring device on. And how far away you're doing it. So, utilize your buddy to stand where you, once you've identified that spot as the highest spot, you want to find the spot on the ground, and you, it's really hard to do that by yourself. So we always say take at least one person when you go measuring trees, not only can they hold the other end of the tape for you, or they can do all the measurements, and you just write, it depends on how you want to do it, but it's always better to have somebody with you. And when you're doing height, I, you almost can't do it because you've walked all the way around and you've identified that spot as the highest and now you've got to try to find the spot on the ground. And walking towards it and making sure you get to it, now you've lost it amongst all the other foliage. But if your buddy's doing that, you can direct him. Nope, farther to the left and then you go around. Nope, step forward a little bit and come back. And you can do a little bit of that, and then you can place your backpack there and say, okay, Mark, <laughs> come out and help me with this, and, and let's take the measurement once, we, once we've identified the spot on the ground. The other thing you've got to be careful of, too, is, is, is any slope. So if, if where you met, you know, where are you actually going to take, if, if the slope is like this, and the high point of the tree is here, do you get to count all the way to there? No. No, because there's a couple feet at least that the tree doesn't didn't grow that way. So you want it, you you really have to pay, take that into account, and sometimes you might have to have your buddy stand there, and you, you're going to do it at his knees. You're going to take your measurement from his, the knees to the to the top of the tree or something like that. So maybe you don't have a handy dandy little clinometer or Mark's thing, which actually I've never used, or in our case, the laser, which I strongly recommend if you're going to do this, but of course it costs a little bit of money. And these are only about, I think, $175 maybe, $1,500 or something like that. So I don't know what yours costs. Like 75 75 Okay. Good. But you don't have to do that. You can use a stick, and you don't even have to use a stick that is as nice and defined as this. It can be a stick off the ground. And um, there's a couple of different ways to do it. <laughs> One of the ways that I think is the best is to hold it out. I'm doing it this way. Straight out. And... Stick yourself in the eye, is essentially what it is. And then keeping your hand absolutely straight, you rotate it up. Now, you cannot move this anymore. This becomes the height of your tree. You can move back, you can move forward, until the base of the tree and the top of the tree are lined up and stop okay I got it right here here's the base there's the top I haven't moved my arm in any way then I just drop it and I measure the distance between here and the base of the tree and I have a really really good height measurement as good as a not very good forester does with a clinometer <laughs> another way I can do it is this same way and I got my buddy again and it is, um, I've just done the same thing, but I didn't have to worry so much about my eye and all that stuff. Sort of and uh, <laughs> then I just line up the bottom with him and the top the, with the bit tree. I'm doing the tree. And then I just say, like this, okay, buddy, walk until you're, you're in line with this. He's at the base. He walks over here. 
she, she walks over here. And when she's at the end, she stops. And then you go measure between the base of the tree and her. And you've got, you, you've got a good measurement there. I have a question. Yeah? Does that work if you are on the incline or yeah. you have, you have to go up or down? Or is there a it works if you are, if you have lined yourself up pretty well with the base of the tree. So if you're, if you are looking, if you're looking up on a cliff and you're trying to measure the tree, no, that's not going to work very well. But if it's more or less level with you, you're going to get a pretty good estimate of that. And on your, your cheat sheet that you're going to get, there's a couple different ways to do the height on here. But you can wow your friends and family with that pretty quickly. Now, one of the things about measurements is that people, for some reason, they get this wrong a lot. <laughs> they overestimate it. We, I've had situations where in this particular tree, this is one, um, the, the forester who nominated this tree gave us a height of something like, I think this was 97. And we said, you know, okay, still around, I can't say <laughs> Not around here, but you'll know who he is. Um, <laughs> I'll say, uh, Anyway, that's not a reasonable height, in my opinion. And he said, yo, I, I measured it three times. I measured it three times. I'm like, well, no, and look. I mean, there's many ways to prove it here. A fence is either five or six feet. I, you know, that's a really good one because it's close. But I know a pickup, and I know the fence related to the pickup. That means it's probably six feet. So I can just, in my office, measure how many fences there are to get up there and I think it's something like 77 feet. Mm -hmm. So really easy to do back at, at the office and, and, and compare. Just, <coughs> just another reason why we but, want. But so how did he make that mistake? What, what was, can you tell how, was, was he too close? I think, actually I think it might have been, been a problem with the clinometer. So there's two sides to the clinometer, and one's a person, and there's two kinds of clinometers, and sometimes you, you really have to read your instruction manual that comes with it, because sometimes it's a percentage, and sometimes it's uh, in chains, and... Chains? Chains, yeah. What's a chain? 66.6 feet. So it's a log logging term. So yeah, that's what I think he did. Well, the other thing could be is it appears that where the truck is is at a lower elevation than the base of the tree. Right. And he could have added that uh, in, too. Well, it could have, except he didn't do it from the photo. He was on the ground doing it. And he su submitted the photo as just part of the, the nomination package, and he had taken his measurement on the ground and said, eh, it's 97, I know it is because I'm, I'm right and I'm good at everything. <laughs> And we ended up, this actually, this actually went on for several months because he was so convinced. And finally we went up there, it's in the, it was in the Dallas area, and we went up there and, um, anyway, needless to say, we proved him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so crown spread. This is the easiest of all measurements, and um, it makes a little bit of sense. Alright, it's rarely you're going to get a nice round thing. So this is one situation where we're looking for the largest. In many of the other measurements, we're trying to take the narrowest, do it, do it very small. But here, we're actually looking to take two measurements, and then we average it, and we're going to find the widest possible one we can find first, or in a situation we had earlier today, a combination that works with the second measurement that is gives you the widest amount. But then you're gonna you're gonna take two measurements, you want them to be perpendicular to each other. So in this case, what we do is we use your buddy again, because one of the things that's really hard to do is to tell where the edge of that crown is. So you think it's right here, and you say, okay, Mark, stand right here. And you're looking up there, and then I am going to walk back a ways and look and see if he is indeed lined up underneath 
that drip line because a lot of times I, I do not know what it is about looking like this. Yeah. You can think yeah. you're that way. You, mm -hmm. you end up being that way or that way, barely underneath it. So once you've done that, you just drop the tape and then you start going all the way along, looking along this perpendicular, along the line, where might be the next widest spot that we're going to find. Mm -hmm. I'll use flags a lot of times to mark a spot. This is where I think it is, and then we might make, make that measurement. This is where the, we'll, we'll put the, the widest spot, we'll put one flag at that end and the other one, and then we can just pick up the tape and start running several different measurements down that line until we come up with the next widest. Now, the good thing is it does not have to go through the trunk. So it can be all the way down here. Say that here it looks like maybe the trunk is there, but maybe it isn't. Maybe the trunk is here and it's just really heavy duty, one branch over that way. It does not have to go through the stem whatsoever. It can go anywhere. And again, I have a calculator that does it. The database does it, so we don't have to bother to figure that out ourselves. But um, you guys will want to know that as you set up your local registry you want to make sure you take the average and then you just, you're going to remember that only one quarter of that figure actually goes into the index. So, this particular tree had 160 inch circumference, 72 foot height, and an average crown spread of 60 feet. So here's our formula. And it comes up with an index of 247. Okay, so that is it for staring at that. <laughs>